So I'm really excited to have joined. Every year at DTC Live, we try and bring one, one of our clients onto the stage so they can, because we hear all this, like, people are terrible. No, but we, we do, we're really proud of the work we do with clients and particularly in-house teams. So we always have a brand working, well, a number of brands working with us in a playbook, which is where we train and upskill their in-house team. I think, as has become clear from all the things I've said today, I have a fundamental belief that really brands need to kind of own some of this stuff in-house, particularly acquisition. It's like the front line, the most vital, a very vital part of the brand. And one of the reasons why brands universally say agencies are bad is because they have this vital work outsourced to somebody. Just want to explain the business model of an agency is, and I know this, having run one for years, is to fragment resource and get things done extremely fast. The more successful an agency is more successful, the more it's able to get work done fast, cheaper, and through, fragmented pe through fragmenting people's minds. Brands, particularly um, in their early stages, say below 5 million in revenue, need full resource, right? This is like trying to get a rocket ship into orbit. This is not easy. And to have fragmented resource on your brand at that time is one of the reasons why we can put up a slide and you guys will universally say, oh, the agencies aren't any good. It's because the two business models are fundamentally opposed, which is one of the reasons why we, and I can see lots of people nodding. And I'm saying this as someone who's run an agency. It's one of the reasons why I've dramatically changed the way we're working because you can't put two things at odds with each other into the same pot and expect that to be a positive outcome. You expect like, that to be a great outcome. I always knew when we had an agency that what the brands need, particularly the smaller uh, brands is way more resource than they would be able to afford to afford to buy when you're actually buying hours from an agency that's adding in its overheads into those hours. So that's my rant about the agency business model. So with that in mind, I'm super excited to welcome one of our playbook clients, Fiona, the CEO of a brand called Nadea, and Shivali, who you know, who's um, my right hand person who Ooh. helps, who does literally everything across the business. And when we do playbook, Shivali and I work very closely with founders to really upskill them and help them drive results and take ownership of those results. So Fiona, welcome. Hi. Tell us about you guys and tell us about Nadea and what you do. Yeah, so I set up Nadea, it's, we're just four years old. I set Nadea up when I was on maternity leave. I find the transition into motherhood really difficult. I find the changes to my body really difficult to understand and accept. And I really felt like the forgotten woman when I kind of went into my regular retail retail stores. I felt like I was kind of shoved to a back aisle in boots. So I found this transition really hard. And I went on kind of my own market research journey to try and find products that really helped soothe my body. You know, I was battered, bruised, stitched up after having babies. So I went on this market research journey and I found that there was thousands of women who felt the same way as me. And also not just women who have had babies, but also women in post or menopause post menopause different kind of uh, stages of life and the big companies weren't really talking about the issues they weren't really talking about the taboo issues so they're not talking about hair loss postpartum depression sleep anxiety and so when I started N Nadea um, four years ago that was kind of the mission and the ethos of the brand was really to bring you know a champion women's health education and bring a lot of education into kind of everything we do we create products with a purpose and a function that really help support women through different stages, stage, stages of life and also to build a really important kind of community for these women because I didn't want women feeling the way I did when I had my baby. So that's, Nadea is a badass woman trying to navigate through life. <laughs> Amazing. And when, when we met you, so Fiona was quite classic of many brand people when we meet them, when she said, um, she said something like, oh, you know, um, well, she's a founder, so building a brand, bootstrapping it and doing it sort of very, you know, organically building it over time, putting a lot of time and focus into it. And she's looking across thinking, right, I want to grow this brand. You know, there's, there's various people in here. I'm not sure whether they're right. You know, there's a guy who does our ads and maybe is he OK? Is he the right person and etc. And I always think it's a real risk to brands when you change agency or move out freelancers, particularly if they have context. So I always try and say to brands, before you just kind of start reshuffling everything, let's just assess what's going on here and what's going on in your brand, how you're reporting, how you're operating, who these people are, are they actually capable? Because loyalty and context counts for a lot in team members. If they are loyal to you, which you had a very loyal team who have a lot of context, then some of the other stuff is just about learning. And it's like the loyalty and context is so important. So we started, so Fiona came into a playbook and 
Um, Fiona, tell us about what you thought. I've told my story of meeting you. Yeah. Tell me from your point of view what you thought about that early stage, like what you were looking for. Yeah, so we had obviously been through a number of agencies. Some of them had really scarred us financially just because, you know, we had hemorrhaged money out to kind of agencies and they had taken over kind of all our processes from running our ads to our email marketing to our content and we lost all that control and then when you remove an agency that's all gone and you know we were le like we still had our in-house team but they did they hadn't learned anything basically from these agencies so we'd spent a year kind of getting ourselves in a steady kind of position to kind of look for something else I knew you know they're a great team, but I felt like we needed more. We needed to grow. And, you know, when I came across, you know, Bolt and what you did and just that kind of, it wasn't, it was never taking anything away from us. It was teaching us kind of about the different areas of the bus business, the different kind of reporting that we should be, you know, as a CEO, there's certain reports that I need to be looking at. And we weren't looking at those or, you know, the cost per acquisition, the lifetime value, all these things we went into huge detail with. And it was, uh, it was a really, it, and I think the team felt really empowered as well, just because they are learning, they're being upskilled. It's not, you know, it's the content isn't being taken away from them. So that's what was, it was really important for us. So, we, I mean, we've done playbooks on small brands like Nadea up to brands like the Inky List, where we're training big D2C teams of like 15 people. I think they all face the same problems. Shiv, we're on the front. Like, what do you think in terms of what, what you see the most common challenges we find with in-house teams that can be fixed, actually? Yeah, and I think this is, I mean, you've got Hannah from your team who, when she watches this, she is incredible. And I think it's, and Fiona's incredible. So it's a team that, it's the team that works uh, as a unit together. The fact is, I've worked brand side heading up digital teams over five years. I don't think I've worked in one that's been resourced to the level the team thinks they need. So I think that's the biggest problem is actually having a um, full, clear objective and a direction and a focus on things that they can control and then things that they can't. Um, and I think a lot of teams find that there's so much going on that we help come in and just give them like five recommendations of what they could be doing next. And that clarity, when you feel so overwhelmed with all the things that we've discussed today, really helps teams, I think. What do you think, Fiona? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there was a lot of, you know, we discovered some hard truths, I think, when we, yeah, sorry. <laughs> when we you know, looked at the, the business and really looked at the details. And one of our problems was kind of our returning customer rate wasn't where it should be. And you guys were like, you have to improve this. You can't, you know, spend more money. You can't invest more in online advertising until you fix this. And the results over the last three months have been amazing. I mean, I think I sent you an, e an email about two weeks ago. Just, you know, I think we've grown 30% month on month and our like lifetime value has really, really grown. And it's just been, you know, it's been great. And it's, it's, it's making small changes within the business that has really led us to this, like this growth. And I find, just on that point, Fiona, like, I find one of the funny things when we went through our audit, it's 75 pages, there's loads of things there. One of the things that I found really interesting about Fiona is you had a gut feel that all of these things were, you know, there was focus of products that maybe could have been changed, which now has helped towards that growth, etc. So while we were going through all the data, you were like, yeah, this makes sense. This is, this is what we've got this intuitive thought behind. Um, so, yeah, I find that really interesting in terms of most CEOs and brand owners and uh, heads of know what's going on. And, but sometimes it's just needing that clarity. What do yeah, you think and I think, that? well, universally across all the playbooks we've done, um, generally the team members who are sort of under kind of scrutiny of are they good enough, are they about to be swapped out or get the heave ho, can be saved because they've got the loyalty in the context. They just need some training. And that's been what's happened with you is that actually... We've up-leveled you, grown your revenue whilst keeping all of the existing team in place and supporting them and allowing them to grow in conf confidence. Generally, acquisition teams across brands are under the cosh. Like, some of the brands are so mean to their acquisition teams, you know. The acquisition teams are on the front line for sure, but they are not wholly responsible for a brand's revenue. So what we do when we go into a brand for a playbook is spread the responsibility and allow all the other team members to understand that it's, this isn't just about the acquisition team or the CPA. Who else is doing what? And why is everyone else just sitting there relaxing while the poor acquisition team are getting it in the neck? In fact, it's, there's a whole load of people within the business who need to understand their revenue drivers and need to understand how they can drive revenue. And that's 
part, part of what we do. Separately is empowering the CEOs or whoever's running the brand heads of to just understand everything because you know, we've just had Elaine up on stage, who's an amazing performance marketer, wouldn't need any of this sort of help. We also had our founder panel earlier, where we've got product creators, really passionate people who've spotted pain points in the market, developed something around that, and had to then learn the whole of e-commerce, which is a different route in, you know, and those people just need some support to help to know what matters. And then I think your point, I'd forgotten about that, where Fiona had asked if she could increase her spend. And it was help you understand like the interlink and I was saying to you well, you can if you want because you know I'm not going to make decisions about who can spend what but I said but if you do without taking this action you're actually going to be putting the brand under a lot of stress and thereby yourself under a lot of stress and I could tell you were quite impatient because you're a bit like <laughs> and I know it's like I want to spend we're here to spend you know yeah. customer acquisition but it's funny you say that because we used to be like, John, why are ads not performing? You know what I mean? And it was like, no, they Yeah, poor are, old John. There's know. always a John somewhere that's taking the brand for everything. <laughs> you know, all the guy's doing is running the ads. It's like, John, why? I know, we were like, why, why are our sales down? And then, you know, it was <laughs> yeah. really analyzing. It was like, Fiona, your returning customer is down this week. So yeah. it's not his problem. What are you doing? Like, yeah. What is the rest of you guys doing? I was like, We were like, oh, wow. John's doing a great <laughs> job. John's fine. It's the same with a lot of the brands. It's like yeah. the acquisition time, leave their in peace. It's all you lot who need to up your exactly. game over here to support the work they're doing. It's true. No, but how have you found that process over me? You, you have had great results. Yeah, we have. We have. It's been amazing. And I know the team have found it amazing. And I think as a, a founder and a CEO, it's just put me in a much better position to make strategic decisions. And also kind of on the finance and looking at scenario planning and deciding where to put the spend, whether to go for finance. I feel like all of that is really just kind of cleared the way. And I, I feel like all of us can we kind of make better, better decisions. And Shiv, let's just talk about resourcing, because as you said, most of the brands we see are, are, are really under-resourced, woefully under-resourced, some of them against the activities they could be doing. Yeah, I mean, first of all, no matter how well you're doing in consulting, no matter what audit you do, if the team isn't willing and able to make those recommendations or even learn the skills needed, mm. then really those type of levels of growth, I mean, 30% month on month are, is amazing, but it's been driven by the fact that team are taking our recommendations on board, they're actioning it in good time, they're doing Monday meetings, they're, they're doing all the things. They're, they're following the rules. They're the following the rules of the payment yeah. and I think when you look at under-resourced and stressed teams a lot of them are actually stressed because either they are just solely focused on the past they're only reporting on what happened last week they're not talking about what could happen next or they're generally under-resourced and that's where agencies or tech partners or hiring does actually need to come in but as a founder, that's always really difficult because you're always constantly navigating things like cash flow, et cetera. And just um, to fulfill talent, our recruitment partners? Yeah, so Luke's in the room. Where Give is us Luke? a wave. Oh. Um, Luke's actually going to be working with Fiona. He is. You've got a few interviews <laughs> yeah. lined up, I've Do. heard. Head of growth. Yes, head of growth role. And that's because you needed that role. So, I did. yeah. And I feel like it was the playbook that made me realize I needed that role. <laughs> And it's an expensive role to hire, it so really it's, is, yeah. it's a decision that brands have to make. And everyone in this room will be in their own stages and be, o and be able to make their own decisions in what's right for you. But being open and being um, able to not just get advice, but action the advice, and then be open to changing your mind on what could have could happen I think is really helpful and I think just the final part on recruiting is because e-commerce is so complicated we we do say you've got to use an e-commerce specialist recruiter to recruit these roles and I'm not just saying that because you're here Luke it's because it's actually the truth no you do because when you see the CV sometimes people say to me I want someone I want them to do this 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 and that we have so much experience I'm thinking well you might be able to get someone who can do Shopify with that but often the wish list that brands have sadly just isn't possible for individuals or not that common that you'll find one individual who can do all of these things. So, you know, it's really important. And, and, and then even when you meet these people, how do you know if they're good or not? I have interviewed so many people from agencies who are like, oh, you know, I've worked in the Coca-Cola account, I'm an amazing performance marketer. And you, then you get them, you actually sit them down to run an e-commerce account and you're like, oh my God, I don't know what Coca-Cola are up to. This person is terrible. Like they're obviously, this is, this is not performance marketing. 
so that's why you know we partner with a couple of recruitment agents uh, who are specialists in the commerce. <laughs> Luke's in the room. He's right there in the grey hoodie. So thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you for having thank me. You, and we have another. Uh, short break now 15 minutes <laughs> and we'll be back but thanks Fiona thanks Thank everyone you.